you really do. You're a 21 year old punk fucking kid. This grandpa's given you everything all your fucking life. You've never had a car payment, a house payment. Everything you live in was given to you by grandpa. You fucking don't know what it's like to work for a fucking living like I do. To bust my fucking ass and do what I do. And you know what, Sean? You fucked me, and that's the way you got it. But you know what? Your grandpa's money will run out someday, and you'll have to feast for yourself. Get a fucking job, you piece of shit. Welcome to Behind the Smoke Podcast, Barbecue War Stories. My name is Sean Walchef from Cali Comfort Barbecue. We are recording at Valley Farm Market above the butcher shop with my man Derek Marceau, and we are in 2018. We made it. Made it. We but made it. Barely. Hopefully, hopefully. But barely. We're, we're recording this early, so yeah, when it's it, a little it, little early. Not... When it drops, uh, hopefully we we have made it. Yeah, it's uh, 2017 was definitely one for the record books. I think we were very very fortunate to. Um, you know, do what we've done and uh, continue to grow. I know us at Valley Farm, we had the busiest day in the history of the store on um, the 23rd. And, Unbelievable. Um, you know, and I, I can't thank my staff enough for how smooth that day felt. You know, we've had some days that have been close and you felt it. And it was it was a hard, hard day. These days... Um, have just felt a lot smoother, you know, and, and we're doing a lot more business. The The butchers understand it. Everyone's working together. You know, we're not against each other. It's all one cohesive team. And I'm telling you, these manager meetings that we're doing, getting everyone on the same team has been the best thing that's ever happened to the store. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it made me happy to come in and to see how busy the store was, but less of how busy the store was to see your team in action. And it was your A team, yeah. you know, Kat, you know, who's been on the podcast before um, she was rocking Chris. He was out at the old Hickory, like literally right when I parked, Chris is running the old Hickory. Like, yeah. and I know he had been there all morning cause I had stopped by earlier. Jeremy was working his ass off. I mean, that was so cool to see them knowing like that this was game time. This is Super Bowl time. You know, this is, this is what, this is what we practice for. Yeah. And a lot of times you, you, can see what people are made of you know yeah. do you crack under the pressure or do you do you stand up and, and fight even harder that's what we always tease about we don't we don't finish when we're tired we finish when we're done you know or we stop when we're done and um my my meat manager charlie um it was one of those things it was kind of like a catch-22 i it's his first year really being the lead in the meat department and i i didn't know if i wanted to you know let him fall too much because this is i mean to be honest i'm i'm not gonna lie about it this these last few days are what carries me through january and february it, it, it gets my float so i can uh, keep people employed so i didn't know if i wanted to mess with it too much i wanted him to stumble a little bit um but not fall so there was a night no no kidding i uh for the first time in almost three years bit the bullet and uh called my dad and said dad you got two hours to spare i need you That's to come rad. down here and uh tie some prime ribs with me that's right and man i'll tell you what he was in his glory he that's was so so, so excited he's he been came waiting down. for that call oh my God. he's been waiting for that fucking i'm call. telling you he was he was like in his glory just what else can i do what you know let's oh do this let's do that and i'm like oh my god dad it's that's uh bad. but it was good it was good it was a good experience with me and my dad just you know back there we've done it for 12 years together sure. you know and now he's retired he's been retired for three years and you know, seeing him come back and in his glory, he was like, okay, what time tomorrow? I'm like, clock out. I'm not paying you <laughs> yeah, anymore. You're, yeah, you're out. But I just, you know, teasing him because he doesn't clock in or out. He never fucking cares about that. But yeah, so it was, it was really, really cool. I um, had a good time and the kids are starting to get to the age now with the, with the Christmas and they're, they're really, you know, enjoying that. So it was a, a good five days for me. It's been an awesome year, 2017. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of challenges, but, you know, to get through our second annual Del Mar barbecue championship up at the racetrack and to really you know solidify our team you know with Corey and layla and abby and bill and derek and jc and i mean we can't do it without all those studs um working as hard as they do and to, you know make us help help us to grow the event well not only that but we brought in all of the people that were on the podcast right you know right. studs like andy harris who from grand ole ends his vacation early just to drive across the country from montana just because he didn't want to dis disappoint us right and, and i think he, i think he learned a lot too i sure. think he understood you know he might even want to compete next year sure you know, just to see what, what he can do in in a competition like that it's i'm proud i'm yeah. very proud of the of the movement we're doing and you know i'm 
it's not just you and I. It's just about everybody. And it's, it's really, it's cool. really, really cool to watch. So 2017 was great. Now 2018 should be better. Dude, there's no better time to be in business. And, <clears throat> I mean, this is a business and marketing podcast. We publish every Friday. Uh, we are so fortunate to be able to have all these doors open up because of barbecue, um, because of the restaurant, because of the butcher shop. And really, we just want to learn more from people that are doing really cool shit, uh, people that are willing to share their struggles. Because if you want to open up a business or if you want to succeed pretty much in anything in life, you have to embrace the struggle, uh, learn from it, and fucking keep grinding. Find comfort in being uncomfortable. Yep. That's really what being an entrepreneur is. You really have to find that comfort because, you know, it's not always it's not always fun, man. It's not always you know, easy and it's uncomfortable, but it's, those are the, that's where you learn the most about yourself and you can push yourself into, to, you know, bigger and better things. And I think that's pretty much what we're trying to do and yeah. trying to accomplish. We've worked so hard, you know, to get, this was the eighth annual Spring Valley tailgate and barbecue festival. And do you remember year six where we almost <sighs> didn't do it? Yeah, I do. My eyes were bleeding. I know. They were literally. <laughs> literally I mean, bleeding. Like, we need to, you need to close your eyes. You need Sean. to close your eyes, Sean. Bad. Yeah, it was, that was a rough year, but um, organizations and training, Shane stepped up to save the event Big for time. us. And um, I mean, it's just, it's come such a long way to have an amateur barbecue contest where that many people are buying in, that many people are enjoying themselves. And, you know, when we started, we wanted it to be other businesses in East County stepping up to the plate and, that happened this year. No, it's, you know? it's huge, and it's, it's happening even more and more and more. You know, and I, I think we want people to understand out here in East County, we have things that we can showcase too. Absolutely, and we're proud of. Sure, and for people to be able to try those things and the new exciting things that are coming out, that's what it's about. It's about uh, everybody. I mean, we had Jack and his wife Whitney come out. My best friend, my best man, dude, Blue Lagoon Coffee. He Shout was, out because we're gonna have we're gonna have him on the podcast. He's he's he's, he's grinding he's, it out. He's he's I doing hope, his thing. I hope he does his thing when he comes on here because he could be one of the funniest guys I've ever fucking met. He's, I just love him so much. Yeah, he's so fantastic, and uh, he stepped up. This was his first event, but he saw the power of what happens when you get involved in a community event and the power that, you know, he was actually interacting. People were trying his coffee and they were just so fired up to, you know, find out when are you opening the shop? And he was working so hard, you know, Whitney had to jump in and she was right. running the coffee machine. Um, but right next to them is our guest today and uh, husband and wife. Uh, we're so fortunate that we have Gerald, Gerald. Cheryl. God, I can't say that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I apologize. But from Snoice, um, your story is so badass because you have come to a part of San Diego that Derek and I obviously love and have embraced, but you're doing something that's so different and something that's so similar to what we do. And we're just so well, we're so happy to have you here on this uh, podcast so you could share a little bit more about, you know, your story and how you guys uh, got to where you are. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background. You uh, from San Diego? Born and raised, born in Paradise Hills, right next to Spring Valley. Okay. Um, went to Morse High School. Uh, graduated. From, Tigers. Yep. <laughs> graduated from Cal State San Marcos. What year did you graduate high school? Uh, 06. 06? So, millennial yeah. for sure. Yeah, millennial. I'm a millennial right, too. Right in the thick of it. Yeah. yeah. I, I call myself a fringe millennial because I, I graduated in 2000, like actually when the world was supposed to end, but oh, it, yeah, did, right. it didn't end. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> but So you graduated and then, uh, then what? Um, right after I graduated, uh, my wife and I uh, you were girlfriend at the time. Girlfriend at the time. I was like married to, in high school. That's, yeah. That's a commitment. No, no, no. Um, well, after college, we moved to New York. Okay. And we wanted to be, she was in marketing and I was in startups and we wanted to be there. And aside from San Francisco, New York was a place to be. So uh, we were in it for like. What did you do in startups? Uh, my background's in um, accounting and coding. So that's what I did when I was there. I worked for a non nonprofit actually, mm -hmm. and what it was, was run name? like a startup. It what was, was the name of the company? It was DonorsChoose.org. Okay. So, um, you, how, how many people? It was about sixty people. Sixty for a nonprofit? Yeah. Wow, that's non significant. Yeah, that's pretty and, good. Yeah, I was on the finance side, so we raised maybe seventy million wow. annually. Wow. And this would all go to public schools. 
okay. was raising and sending nationwide nationwide wow. yeah um and so it was cool it was cool to be in um and just be in that startup feel and for me it's all about community so i wanted it fed my soul at the same time and it was grinding and i got to learn a lot that's there. cool did you have yeah. any mentors there or anybody that kind of showed you the ropes yeah so the ceo he, he's been in all the magazines what's um, his name dang. uh charles best <laughs> okay yeah um, well, everything we talk about will be in the show notes, so there'll be links to the companies we talk about or any social sites, um, so you can uh, go check that out afterwards. But nice. But what did he teach you? He was just so high level. Like I sat next to him, and I got to see what his workflow was, and I came in at the lowest tier, and so it was interesting to see what was on my work plate versus what he was, you know, considering. And so coming back and starting something and being at the top, it, it was an easier transition because you don't think about those or you don't stress about those little things. You, sure. You try to balance it out. So. And um, then you and your wife moved back here? Yeah. Yeah. She moved first. Um, I still worked there. I came back, worked remotely for a little bit, and then started. It's nice. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wait, and you had your son? Uh, before you before you started Snoys? Right before we right started Snoys. Right before Snoys. you. Okay, so why did you guys decide to open up uh, a shop? Um, so my wife's family is in the restaurant business. They own a bunch of bakeries, um, Tapex, which are boba shops, maybe five franchises, two creamistries. So they're they're deep in it. Really? So did she grow up working in them? Not working in them. But oh, really? Like basically but living, being, in them. living in them yeah, yeah sure all but here in san diego all here in san diego wow, mostly cool. in national city some in mira mesa okay that's filipino bakeries sure um well tell yeah. us tell us more about snois so we get an idea of what you guys sell yeah because it's really i mean <laughs> fuck you got to go to their instagram page it is like i mean my wife when she saw that that she's like what how the fuck did i not have any of that during barbecue festival i'm like well, not well, even was, that it's just like six thousand oh. people on the street and you had a, you had our son so well you'd see like you know some shaved ice or whatever you know it's like okay you know i've had it before not like this not like this. this is completely completely different and so fucking good well it's it's so impressive just the press coverage that you've been able to get and that's Gen genuine press coverage. I mean, you're doing it because your product is unique. It's part of the culture. It's part of the story. So tell, tell us a little bit how, how it all happened. Yeah. So how'd I mean, you jump off the entrepreneurial cliff? I uh, like to say, yeah. you guys are just, you're, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for inspiration and you have like an endless list of projects <laughs> and this is just one of them. Right. <laughs> and, um, we never, I, I mean, while our family's in it, my wife and I aren't like chefs or anything. We're not mm -hmm. trained in it. Um, so this was the last thing on our list, but um, there was an opportunity to kind of, um, well, let me back up. Diane's family wanted to hand down the bakery to her. And so this was a compromise. She wasn't ready for that. And we still kind of moved in and started our own thing. Really? And, you know, flexed our, our startup muscles. And that sure. It started. takes a lot for her to say that she's not ready. I mean, that that's a huge testament to her. Was this location? What was this previously? It, it's always been at the same spot, uh, right inside Cabo Bayan Bakery, which is her parents. Uh, okay. So it's in the bakery. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. How big yeah. is the bakery? Uh, maybe like, 2000 square feet okay. it's like three shops connected okay yeah okay. and so we started off in the corner with like a inside the actual shop yeah okay right yeah with like a cart we were trying to go mobile but uh -huh. then you know three months later this was 2015 like 20 yeah 2015 wow and then they were like let's cut a hole in the wall and like put you in and <laughs> really it's Your, her literally par her parents wall. Yeah. Said that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so Cause were you guys getting traction when you were in the store? You were getting a lot of traction. How? That's why just we we put up a hut and like held a little grand open soft opening, grand mm -hmm. opening, and they saw it and it was like at the end of summer, so they saw the potential and they're like, Okay, let's give you a chance. Like we don't want you going around with a cart. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, was it did, how did you get the word out was it on social just social so yeah what what were you mostly using just I, instagram Insta? yeah. yeah and instagram was good with ads back then too mm -hmm. before they changed the algorithm mm -hmm. so, right yeah so what i mean you got there's got to be some type of like you just liked shaved ice you liked the bobas and that you said i can do that i mean I, how, how'd that even 
I think it was like you guys, like it was the first time we were exposed to it in New York. We mm -hmm. didn't think much of it. We came back. There was one shop called Icemo that opened up in Convoy and mm -hmm. we we're like, hey, this is new. Let's try it because we've done Bobo before, you know, but we've never seen shaved ice like this. Yeah. And so we paired it with Holo Holo, which we serve and is our best seller now. And yeah. Now, do you have to have a different, like, talk about like the machinery, everything, because to me, this is really exciting because I, I don't know much about it. So I know I'm going to learn a lot of ice cream too. I, <laughs> I mean, that's, it's no joke. I'm not, I'm like, I'm really, really big into ice cream. I need to stop. But, um, so what, I mean, is it different types of, <laughs> you know, machinery to get the ice as thin as you want it and the, the texture that you want. And is there different, you know, types of plates that you can use that make it more coarse, more fine? How does that work? Yeah. So, um, with our shaved snow, we use a flash freezer and, um, it, it helps get that texture. Uh, we used to try and make it out of the regular freezer and uh -huh. it'd take two days gotcha. and we didn't get the texture that we wanted. Mm -hmm. So we started off kind of selling, other people's product in LA. Yeah. And then oh, really? refining our recipe and trying to get it to their quality. Um, we wouldn't serve anything that was less quality. So if, once we came up with a recipe, we replaced it with ours. Really? Yeah. So yeah. how did you guys go about your recipe process and your, you know, the back end development process? Just a lot of, you know, trial and error. Trial and error. See what um, other people are doing in other mm -hmm. markets. Mm -hmm. And a lot of help from everyone on the staff. We just let everyone in and said, Hey, go you're at it. You're open, transparent. Yeah. That's hard. I mean, I know yeah. it's hard for me to let go of the rain sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, but so what do you guys do for, I, I would imagine there's got to be some type of off season, right? Because it, when it's not, I know we're very fortunate where San Diego is pretty fucking hot all the time and it's, <laughs> it's the weather's always good, but it, when it cools down a little bit, does the business slow down? Do you guys have to kind of go more towards because you you're teased as well, right? Yeah. So it slows down a lot. I think people, it's weird because people crave ice cream and drinks. Yeah, no fucking cold. shit. <laughs> I, mean, I crave ice cream every day. <laughs> right? But it's definitely a difference between summer and winter. Yeah. Um, we take this time to kind of work on other projects like remodel the store, or, you know, do different things. Like last year, we, we did a Kickstarter campaign and raised $10,000 to really? remodel yeah, the store. How was the Kickstarter campaign? Uh, the Kickstarter campaign was grinding. Really? Yeah. We barely made it. <laughs> we, talk, we talked to, uh, from Hart and Trotter, and yeah. he was telling us about the, the difficulties with the Kickstarter campaign. I you never knew. I learned that raise, day. Yeah. If you don't raise the, the your minimum or whatever you set out to, it all goes away. Yep. I had, I had no idea. Yeah. So you guys set out to get $10,000 and barely made it? Yeah. 10147 Yeah. Nice. Yeah. The last pledger was actually family that dropped one K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Saved us. Like, well, yeah. I mean, you have, to, but, but you have to put, put that out there. You know, you're like, mm -hmm. Hey, we need help. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're at nine and we need to get to 10. It forces you to go and be uncomfortable and go ask as many people as you can because mm -hmm. you don't want to lose the nine. Right. Mm -hmm. Are those macaroons? Macaroons. Yeah. So we always try to collab with local uh, entrepreneurs and businesses. Uh -huh. and that's a, a guy named Damien uh, Abrams, and he owns Delicious Desserts, and he stocks his um, ice cream sandwiches, macaroni ice cream sandwiches at our store. Jesus. Yeah, he does amazing work, like churro macaroni ice Who cream Who does sandwiches. all the camera work? Camera work. Uh, my brother-in-law. Yeah? Yeah. So camera work's very important. I mean, obviously, food photos are probably the most difficult things to take pictures of, Um one of the things that we're fortunate is, you know, my wife, she, she absolutely loves photography. Um, but you, you have to be willing to also learn it yourself. You know, you have to know how to take a picture with an iPhone because you always have an iPhone. You have to know how to take video with an iPhone, but like, it's got to look good. And like that goes, we talk about reverse engineering the, the menu from the Instagram photo, literally, you know, you're, you want it to look sexy, but you need to get back to, you know, these ingredients. And how did you guys go about getting those ingredients? Was it based off of color, taste, texture? It was based of off, I mean, the customer, like mm -hmm. whatever uh, audience we were catering to. And so our neighborhood in Paradise Hills is Filipino and we knew we would be able to grow through them. And so ube was our most popular flavor. And it was a trending flavor. What's ube? Too. Ube is a purple yam. Yeah, so we're going to ask a lot of these questions because we have. <laughs> well, yeah, no. I've, what's ube? Where do you get it? <laughs> right. Where does it grow? <laughs> Seriously. 
purple yam, and it's like a classic staple ingredient from okay. the Philippines. Purple um, yam. Yeah, and it was like trending in 2017. All the Filipino chefs were using it, and others were starting to play with it. Okay. Um, How many Filipino chefs do you think there are in San Diego, or do you have any idea? Not a lot. Not but a I lot. mean, like in the scene that we are, we're in, like Filipinos love to cook, so mm-hmm. right. they try to they find their way to the top of the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, Philip Esteban uh, owns cons- or not owns, but he works with cons- Consortium Holdings. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a creative director there. Really? And so, um, a lot of people from, you know, our area, apparently sure. still so spring Valley, um, you know, uh, just playing with these foods and exposing and exposing them. Absolutely. To the rest of the no, I mean, that's, it's probably one of the most difficult things to do, but it's probably one of the most important things that we do in business now is that, you know, the corporate culture of, you know, 31 flavors and Baskin Robbins growing to what it used to be. I mean, there's a reason why pink berries, you know, made a name for themselves. Like there's a reason why all these different, fr- because people love dessert, people love ice cream, but like now you need to get back to the roots and culture, tradition, those things are important to you. Um, how did you guys go about that process? Um, so, I mean, I think that's what we're thinking of when we move back is what do we want to do, uh, especially raising a child, what, what, because the business is an extension of you. So what did we want our values to express? And it was culture and family. And um, naturally, it was Filipino desserts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everyone was in the business for it. And, and then just an extension of it is we grew up here in San Diego. So it's a little different. It's not just Filipino. It's mm-hmm. Filipino American. There's boba shops everywhere. That's sure. not Philippines. Um, and just like the trendiness and like everything we've worked with. There's hip hop in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a part of us. And just like, you know, Instagram well, and celebrating, like, celebrating all the things that make you local and make is you. Is there unique. any lumpia anywhere? <laughs> that's yeah. what I fuck them up. Yeah, it's actually a Cabo Mine Bakery and they have like unbiased, like some of the best. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah that you what can is get it called? Lumpia. Yeah. No, what, where is it at? A uh, couple of, the, the oh, store the, that we at, share at the bakery. With. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. We, sometimes we sell it out of Snoyes, uh, okay. 10 pack. But, really? Yeah. So you can try it out. Are these, are these two separate businesses or? Yeah, they're two separate. So you businesses. have your own purchase orders with your own vendors, mm-hmm. different vendors. Well, we get it. We source the Lumpia from couple of bakery mm-hmm. and we just fry them up. Uh, t- because they sell in bulk, usually like hundreds of Olympias. But now, with the Kickstarter, did you guys get to do your renovation and everything's yeah? Good and-, and that's the most stressful part too. Is like, how do we use this money? Because ten thousand isn't a lot right. for the restaurant industry. No, but, you, know. <laughs> you, can like, buy, you can buy one oven or half an even. oven. Yeah, like, <laughs> buy half an oven for that. Half an oven. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. Those are some of the biggest challenges that we had while we were growing. Was you want to get the best equipment when you're opening up because I mean, when we were working with Gene, he always wants the best because he's already used the shitty one, Mm. but like sometimes it's just not in the budget. So you buy, you know, an ice machine that's supposed to put out a certain amount of volume and then only to find out like a year later, you need another, you need it. You needed a bigger ice machine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we got to the point where we bought literally two of the same ice machines where we thought one was going to be good enough for us and it didn't happen. So yeah. wh- how did you guys go about um, deciding what you were going to do? So it's the same. But, I mean, the focus with the Kickstarter we, was we promised we'd renovate the dining area and make it more of a community space. Because, you know, on the, our back end, it's those challenges like matching demand and supply. Mm-hmm. But for the Kickstarter, we focused on just trying to expand the space or, like, fit more people and, like, have it have it flexible enough to host events so let's talk about your event background uh before we get into why you guys do events where'd, yeah. you, where'd you work at so uh it's funny um my parents own a party rental and catering business and that's what i grew up with um i used to clean the astro jumps and like the <laughs> chairs and tables <laughs> right so it's always parties yeah um and so, uh, I astro think- jumps are so hot. <laughs> I haven't been to a kid's party that didn't have an astro jump. It's like, you can't even have a party unless you have an astro jump. We bought goes. one. I know. One. Yeah. Because it was like, <laughs> I was like, I can't. Two see. kids were expecting a third kid. It paid for itself. <laughs> it I does. bought a commercial one. We have, we have two actually between me and my neighbor. And it's like, dude, we're spending $300 every single time. We went, there's a guy that was going out of business for an auction. We bought two of them for less than a thousand bucks. 
I already made my money. Oh yeah. yeah. And sometimes we just put them out in the in the backyard, just let the kids go. Hey, so don't awesome. kid yourself. Sometimes I go lay out. <laughs> Calm it's down, the best you know? distraction. Where yeah, they're safe and yeah. you know they can just you can do whatever you want and yeah. the kids will be safe. How old were you when you started working for your family business? Thirteen. Really? Like 13 me? Yeah, it was yeah. Pretty much. I think it was twelve. Working busing tables and washing dishes. Fucking hated it. <laughs> right? It was miserable. <laughs> God, it sucked. But I'm so gra- so grateful that my grandfather made me do that. Um, it's taught me how to work now. But I mean, when you're a kid, you're like, this sucks. Like sixth grade, seventh grade, and you're like, I don't. On the weekends, I don't. I want to go fuck around with my friends and go to the beach or go play basketball. Like this is crap. Absolutely. But no, I, I had to work for different reasons, but. <laughs> Um, my reasons are because I was bad. <laughs> my parents, uh, it was my punishment. I'd have to go work at the car washes. My mom and stepdad owned car washes and I'd have to, in the summers, go work there or come here and, uh, work because either bad report card or referrals or detention or whatever I was <laughs> doing bad back then. Um, but I'll tell you what, it stopped. It stopped because, you know, I was like, okay, I can either be bad and not have a summer or be good and then go surf and do all the shit in the summer. And I figured it out eventually. It took, right. took a little while. Is your <laughs> the family business still operating? It still yeah. is. Um, How many she, employees? Uh, maybe like five. five. She grinds it out. She, your she, mom? Yeah, yeah. She used to work full-time uh, as a nurse, two jobs, and the business on the side. So, really? Yeah. That, two, wow. A nurse and another job? What was the other job? Both nurses. Both so, nurses? Yeah. Two nurse jobs? Yeah. And the business? Yeah. She started the business also? Yeah, on the side. So it was Get a weekend. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. That's so impressive. How long have they been, how long has it been in business? Since, uh, I think over a dozen years now. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, 15 years. 15 I can't even years. Count. That's so fucking impressive. Yeah. And other people like to complain that they have too much work. (laughs) Fucking kidding me. (laughs) Wow. That's so impressive. So you worked there for what? 10 years? For 10 years. um, I was managing it. Doing everything. Yeah. And then we butted heads because it's a family (laughs) business, right? right. (laughs) Butted heads. I kind of quit. So she's on her own now, but I think I left enough groundwork where she can play with and like hire people and help her out because, uh, She's a woman, and it's hard. It's sure. carrying tables and chairs, and right. sometimes she forces herself to do it. You did, know? did you help her go digital with, yeah. with, the, with the business? I mm-hmm. mean, so much of all different businesses and different industries are facing the reality that the old way of doing business doesn't work, mm-hmm. and you have to adapt to what, what's happening in 2018. In 2018, you know, people, I mean, I, if, if I'm ordering anything, you know, like I need, we're, we're focusing on just this year to put our menu online so that you can order. You don't have to call the host. You can actually just order from your, your iPhone. That's and awesome. that's a big deal for us because it's a, it's a pressure point that sucks. I mean, I hate calling and getting put on hold. Like I don't want to make our customers go through that. And you know, those things are important for any business. How much of your business is pickup? 20%. No fucking way. Yeah. How, and we I, don't, how we don't, did I not know that? I don't know. Wow. Have you, well, yeah. So the, the, you definitely have a, a need for it. Fuck yeah, yeah. It's a priority. It's it's already in motion. Someone can just do it on their phone. Convenience, yeah. boom. No, bang don't it have out. to wait on hold. Don't have to call the host. So you're gonna have to have someone that's 100 percent on that. Or uh, we already do. We already do. Yeah, we already have somebody that's on. Layla. <laughs> <laughs> Layla's will actually like it. Layla and so will Eric because you can do the catering processing as yeah. well. It won't have to be a separate process. But I had no idea 20 percent of your business was yeah. take out. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah crazy well that, that i mean that's just another i mean variable. that's why we dedicated those three spots in the front of the restaurant just for pickup yeah that's just another variable because think about what you have to do to make sure that when they get their food and when they take it back to wherever they're at it still has to be good and present itself it's a huge that's challenge. fucking nuts huge challenge but it's a huge opportunity totally yeah you know it's a huge opportunity i guess the way you have to look at it right mm-hmm. jesus man well, yeah, figure that out. Figure I'm, work, that shit I'm out. working on that. that I'll, I'll, online, I'll report back. <laughs> yeah. Um, 2018, right? 2018. That's your goal. 2017. 18. This next year is going to be your goal. I'm going to do it in reverse. There you go. I'll get it done. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about transitioning out of family, bu- out of one family business into your, you know, because you have your family that you grew up in and now you have your family, yeah. you and your wife and your son and like the philosophy behind 
opening up the shop. So I think growing up in a family business, like you're just like so frustrated with <laughs> the things, like especially if they're old school, you know, you try to change it. So that's why I went to business school is like our books aren't straight and yeah. things like that. So I try to fix it. Um, and then uh, with the event space, I went over to New York and startups, they love throwing parties. So um, we just threw parties all the time. Um, I was involved with Startup Weekend, which is a weekend event where we teach entrepreneurs to start their own business, create nice. a business over the weekend. Really? And Jump off the cliff in one weekend? Yeah, one That's weekend. Awesome. Just wow. pitch it to actual investors and they That's get rad. judged on it. Um, and this is worldwide, worldwide movement. And um, it was just volunteers planning these events. So I, I was lucky to plan. You were working for the company. At it, the was, it was all volunteers. All volunteers. And nonprofits. Rad. That's so, awesome. Yeah. But you're working with other people that are excited about opening up a business. And yeah. Doing events, actually. Were, they, were people paying to go to these events? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're paying 120 to, you know, learn from people in the industry and then, you know, jump off the cliff and pitch. Um that was cool because you know you get exposed to all these people um you know entrepreneurs especially in new york you know what's cool is to to listen to you and and hear your mindset on things because i think a lot of times people they want to wait wait around wait for um something to fall into their laps where you were saying look look i'm gonna go get these experiences yeah it's not gonna pay me a lot of money but these things, you can't put a fucking dollar figure on them. What you learn from the CEO sitting next to him, what you learn from this company, there's nothing that's ever going to, you can, you can't pay for stuff like that. Um, so that's, it's really cool just to hear you embrace those things. Cause I think that's what we talk about a lot on the podcast is get out there and do it. Just do it. It's, it's sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's a grind, but you're never going to get that experience back. I mean, you, you have to be able to say, okay, it's not, fun sometimes and i'm not i'm struggling probably you might have not been able to pay the bills sometimes and but you're you're getting something that's far more valuable than just a monetary value mm. i think entrepreneurs are impulsive <laughs> you know like, well, yeah you have, <laughs> you have to have a certain asshole gene to <laughs> right. be able to deal with the fact that it's all on you i you think know, i have two end, of those genes you have two of those genes <laughs> um so so tell us because community is so important to us. What I just saw up on the on the uh, screen, you did some stickers from Paradise Hills, just yeah, embracing talk about the, the made, um, made in Paradise Hills. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty fucking cool. So Made in Paradise Hills, we we actually just themed it that for our one year anniversary because we met some cool chefs and some businesses from Paradise Hills, mm -hmm. and so we invited them over to our parking lot and we. So wait, the you thought lot. you thought outside of your store, and you actually invited the competition in. We love that. Uh, not exactly the competition, but I mean, well, it's never not, a competition. They're not competition. Yeah. It's, it's commun the problem is people see it as, oh, that's the store across the street. They're going to steal my customer. It's like, this is our neighborhood, man. Right. Like, yeah. If we don't fucking care about our neighborhood, then there's nothing good that's going to happen here. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so you mean, invited them we in. We invited them in, and um, it was just a party. It was just a big block party, and people attended. Did you actually shut down the street, or you did it in the parking lot? Yeah, we just did it in the parking lot. No security. That's what the first concern was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but when you started You did off, it at you, night? At night. Lights? Um, barely any barely lights. Barely any lights. Yeah. <laughs> totally unprepared, but, you know, we didn't know what it would turn into, but it was sure. like 400, 500 people in that's a, rad. a parking lot. And, you know, there's nothing in Paradise Hills. That I mean, that's, like that. that's why we, I mean, that's why we have so much respect for you is, you know, coming out here to Spring Valley. I mean, Derek's shop's been here for 62 years, but, you know, celebrating Spring Valley and changing the perception of what Spring Valley is was so important to us because there's so many great people that live out here, hardworking people that, you know, they want to have a place that they can call their own. You know, it's part of the neighborhood and, you know, the Spring Valley Barbecue Festival was, that was the catalyst for us to go out and start talking to other businesses and say hey you know we need your help to put this event on let's celebrate what we have here in spring valley in east county and not that it's getting you out of your comfort zone but not only you it's getting other people out of their comfort zones right so it's it's forcing relationships to to grow that might not have happened so you're getting this person who might have been thinking the old way Oh, I'm not going to go talk to them. They're my competition. They're across the street. Well, now you put everyone together and everyone's in a positive environment where we're trying to build something, some camaraderie around the neighborhood. Then they, their, their walls start coming down a little bit. Right. You, you can see it. You can literally see it in people. You're like, dude, I, the way his attitude was and the way it is now, 
we had something to do with that. Completely different. Yeah. Well, it's not only that, but now you guys both care about the street itself, like the fucking physical street that actually has been neglected for all this time. Now you start caring. And I mean, you guys got um, tremendous press coverage, which I, we have to talk about. Tell us about the graffiti initiative. So the graffiti was, you know, we met. We know, we know, owners. we live in, we live in Spring Valley. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're well aware of the graffiti problem, it's not but like, it's, but it, it can be a problem and it can be a nuisance or it can be an opportunity. Right. And uh, some of those same graffiti artists turn the page and they learned, you know, it's not just about marking it. It's, it, it's a creative form, but we can it's an artistic it. form. Yeah. You know I mean? I always joke around, you know, cause if somebody puts graffiti, I was like, we need more art classes. Like these people can't express themselves. Like, you know, you, you want to have a logo of whatever tribe you're in. Great. Like, let's start, let's have a branding class and let's talk about it. But like, let's get them a fucking palette so they can, they can, you know, express themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you guys did that. Like you, you didn't talk about it. You actually did it. You went out and you got what other artists together. Yeah, so uh, there was this guy named Brandon Bartholomew. He paints all over North Park and um, just on those uh, utility boxes. Yep. And we invited him out to say, hey, you want to be a part of this project just to replace the graffiti with some. Did you already have the art? connection or you had to reach out to him? Just reached cold, out, call, cold call. Uncomfortable. Hey, this is who we are. This is what we're trying to do. A lot of cold calls. Isn't but that yeah, cool? the cold call worked. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I mean, you. You see it on the news, or but so many people don't take the action. Like, oh, that would be cool if we did that in our neighborhood. But like, it takes somebody, and it's a lot of extra fucking work. You know, it has nothing to do with running your shop, but it does. Like, it absolutely does because once you go and you put yourself and you create this community event where you're bringing in other businesses that are in Paradise Hill and you're celebrating Paradise Hills. Now people are taking pride in paradise hills right mm -hmm. i mean they're fired up i mean you guys had such an incredible turnout this last year i mean i wish i could have made it to it but i, I watched it all on social you guys did a great job you know talking about the event doing facebook live doing all kinds of stuff that is really cool because people are proud to be a part of that event artists all the people that you had talk tell us a little bit how of how it went was this the second year or first year like first official year the first official year of that event the night market the night market um but it all started from that one year anniversary because right. we didn't think it would grow into anything, but it was people asking, Hey, we got to do this again. We got to, you know, we love seeing the businesses. We, we never knew that this business was from this area. Sure. And so, well, you know. it, it, all of a sudden it creates pride of family too, because there's family businesses that it's just been stagnant. You know, it's been stagnant. It's been year over year, you know, either the, the next generation's either embracing it or they're not, but now it's like, well, something's shaking that up something shaking up our normal dick course of like literally we shut down the street so it's like you know neighbor, the people driving by like well why is our street shut down well it's shut down because there's you know amateur barbecue teams out here we're promoting you know spring valley and all these things but that gets people excited and they're like now they tell mom and they tell dad and they tell grandpa and they tell you know the kids like come on out like let's go and show off our business and let's improve that window that's been broken or that needs to get fixed up. And like, let's make it better. And now all of a sudden you've got this pocket, this community and this village that's actually doing something that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And then they think about it and they're like, well, next year, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to do this to improve it. To, to see that there's other communities <clears throat> that are embracing this too, because Paradise Hills is, is very similar to where we're at, where it's an eclectic group, right? And how do you get everyone together? And like you said, make sure you have enough security to make, you know, because we don't live in the best neighborhood sometimes. But to see that there's leaders out there that are doing that, that's what's important. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about everyone. It's about everyone in the community coming together and having a sense of pride that's what's going to build the community and make it better. You know, as much as Sean and I would want to go out and pick up all the trash on the street and try to clean everything up, we're only two people. But if we can bring everyone together and give everyone the sense of pride, like, hey, we're going to make Spring Valley great again. I mean, not to be political, <laughs> I didn't, yeah. that, that didn't come out right. But, um, you know, we are nowhere near as impactful as we are with without everyone involved. You know, getting everyone together, going towards a common goal, saying how, how can we – you know, make this great. That's where you start make you start seeing changes. You know, and kudos to you for for doing that and being that leader because it's not it's not easy. And to make those cold calls, 
dude, that sucks. I don't. Oh know. god, it's so hard. Yeah, it's hard to to do. I mean, sometimes I'm like, hey, Sean, do you want to call him? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I, I mean, sometimes it's not a cold call. You have to reach out through email. You have to send a direct message. Like in this day and age, we have a lot of ways to get in touch to not have to go through a gatekeeper but like if you're true and you're honest and you're telling people this is what i'm doing you know you have a skill set that could be very valuable and i'm sorry i don't have any money to pay you but like we're trying to build something that's bigger than paradise hills and it's this because there's villages all over the world you know mm -hmm. like this happens all over the world but it takes a catalyst and it takes going outside of your normal course of business to understand that if the community isn't embracing it, then eventually people aren't going to be in that community. You know, if you look at malls across America, like the old mall tradition, the big box retail stores, that like that's failing. So people are fine. Like, how do we get people to big come back time. to the Walt malls so that, you know, all the moms aren't just sitting on their phone and ordering products through Amazon Prime to come to the, to the door? Well, what are they doing? They're changing it. So it's like you don't have to go and make a transaction. We're making it a community space where there's uh, there's comedians, there's people playing music, there's a place where you can take care of your kid, there's a changing table, there's a place for your dog. Like, I just want to go there. I don't have to spend anything, but it's like, Rosie just went to UTC. I haven't been there yet, but she's like, she can't stop talking about it. She's like, it's like probably one of the most vibrant places because it's it's anti-mall. I mean, it's anti what we grew up knowing what a mall was. You see, that's how they do it? Did you know that's, oh, that's how they rad. do it? Oh, that's rad. I saw that idea. photo. <laughs> that's fucking cool it's really so, cool how'd you come up with the name that's uh, it's a little different yeah so it was actually a joke we didn't think <laughs> it, yeah uh it was it's obviously a play on words right. snow and ice but um snow ice we were watching key and peel and there's this episode where he just keeps saying noise noise right. <laughs> and uh yeah it caught on it was the most memorable we almost right. called it something lame like snowhound or something <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And then the logo. And the logo? Yeah. The logo. Don't tell anyone of this, but it's a dollar logo. It's like an icon off a website. It's yeah. rad. And we bought rights to it. Yeah, but it's clean. Yeah. It's clean. It's yeah. clean. And yeah. it's sexy. Like the like the packaging, the you know, the way that it, everything's presented, you have like that's your brand. And it's gonna change because we op we were a California comfort restaurant when we first opened. Restaurant and sports bar until I started realizing I can't fucking market that. That's way too many syllables. Like like we evolved, but like you have to be true to who you are, but you also have to try to like, if I don't want to wear it, you know, Derek and I talk about this all the time for retail and merch. Like if we're going to go out and we're going to send our catering team to, you know, go take care of Fox five down at the goals and take care of like all the news anchors and the president, Scott Heath, who's been on the podcast, we better fucking look sexy. Mm -hmm. Like we better be proud to be there. We better have, you know, the tablecloth that we want that has our logo on it. You know, all those, th it took a long time to get there but micro steps to get there. And I've, I've seen the catering stuff that you guys have on your website and it's, you know, you have a step and repeat, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. not cheap to buy that. No. But why do you have it? It's, it's branding. It's branding. Was... So when people get that sexy ice cream at that pop-up, you know, that you guys do, they're going to take a photo there and they're going to hashtag it on Instagram or on Twitter or on Facebook and be like, where did you get that? I mean, it, did, did you guys have a PR company that got you all that press? No. How'd was, you get it? How'd you get just... all that press? We were just, I don't know, it was we just walked into it, yeah. and, you know, meeting people like you guys, you know, people that were in the industry. The first person that we met was um, Nines, Nino Camilo, who does uh, I Love Poke Festival. And I think that was our big, you know, piece, that tipping point where he introduced us to a few people and just doing this work with the community just got the press. And so, because you're true, you're authentic, you're not bullshitting yeah. anybody. You're like, this is what we're trying to do. We're not, this is our story. I mean, you go on your website, this is our story. This is our family. We're family, we're culture, we're community. Like that's, those are the things that we care about. And like, I don't, we don't just say them, we do them. Mm -hmm. Like Kickstarter to have more space, to have open mic night, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why is open mic night so important? I think it's, it's going back to the values of, you know, raising your kid. We wanted to have him be exposed to all this talent and like also have the, the community come together and be inspired by others and it doesn't have to be anyone professional or on the news it's your neighbor who's trying to put themselves out there as a comedian and try these lame jokes and get you to laugh sure you know so people that haven't taken any classes but have the potential you know it's that inspiration that we wanted to catalyze the neighborhood and that sure. was 
that was a priority for us. What do you guys do for, did you say catering? You guys go out and, and do things like, let's just say I have a kid's party or, you know, you guys will come out and, and what's the minimum for, for that? And, so we set it at 50 people, yeah. which is like out of the reach of, you know, a house party. Mm-hmm. Usually um, we try to focus on weddings and, you know, big events. Um, but we per person per person. Yeah. Yeah. We're actually trying to simplify it cause we have like some complicated calculator to, you know, um, calculate all the costs on our end and totally, mark yeah. it up. We had to, we do the same shit all the time. That's, yeah. It's been way easier for me to do it per person, even though on the back end, everything that I have to do to get to that number is fucking gnarly, but they don't need to know that. Yeah. You know, I don't need, I don't need to complicate it for them. I'll let us do all the work. And then I say, here's a price. And they say, Oh, that's too much. I say, well, that's, that's it. I, I can't do it for any cheaper than that. I lose money, you know? So, yeah. <coughs> so we're actually in the process of trying to even simplify it even more with yeah. per head and make it transparent. Cause a lot of the catering companies, it's like, what do you want? And it's then we'll the best for the price. Transparency right. is yeah. like, I mean, our guiding principle for building our catering was to the easier we make it on us and the easier we make it on our guest. And the more reasonable it is where we tell them this is what this is what you do, like they're going to order more and mm-hmm. we work to get it on our website so that we had a woofoo form so they didn't have to call the hostess and wait for the hostess to get a manager and then they're on hold and the manager's way too busy to be talking about catering, you know, getting those things digitally on our website, breaking them down, like Derek said, per person where it's this is what it is. This is our minimum. You know, this is our payment terms like you, you pay in advance. Those things have to happen because if they don't happen, it makes it that much harder on the operation. Plus, it just it doesn't feel right. You know, mm-hmm. and like it should be easy. Like, you know, the companies that are going to win are going to have a pleasurable experience. Like it's already a pain in the ass to be the office manager and have to, do, you know, you, you're responsible for the end of the year party for 40 people, you know, end of the year party for 40 people. Like it better be good. It better be memorable. Like our job is to make it easier on that office manager so that they're like, dude, I'm just going with Cali Comfort because I know they're going to they always bring the A team and they make me look like a rock star. Mm-hmm. Like I look like a rock star because I brought them in and mm-hmm. Layla and Steven, they came and they just made like this incredible spread. And then they had to go boxes and they took care of us. That's, that's how you're going to win. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. that, that sounds like what you guys are looking at doing. Yeah. And catering is so hard for us because <laughs> we, we offer everything on the menu and we're trying to simplify it. Right. And every event's different. You know, you got to calculate costs. If, well, you have, you have to you go have up the equipment stairs. too, right? Yeah. You have equipment like, too. stuff. So some of the biggest challenges as any restaurant is your delivery time. You know, where are you making the food? How are you prepping it? Are you making it on site? Do you have the equipment to make it on site? You know, especially when you're dealing with ice. Mm-hmm. Do you have to bring generators? Do you have a truck that's refrigerated? How do you how do you work that? Sometimes, uh, sometimes yeah. but I mean, since we're on site, sometimes they're in a building and we just plug in. Right. And it's a standard outlet. Okay. Um, or 20 amp or what do yeah. you need? Do you, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. What what does it usually cost per person? Where are you guys at right now? Six dollars. Yeah, wow. that's it. Six dollars. Yeah, that's it. Come on now. Yeah, I might have you just come thinking. over. Just for, <laughs> come on now. Yeah, Dude, six dollars. <laughs> yeah. Six bucks a person. That's nice. Three hundred bucks. Yeah. Less than three hundred bucks. Yeah, three hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. Any service on top of that? No. To come out. That's it. Yeah. You yeah. Gotta, you six dollars a person. Um, we try to keep it lean. Send one person out and yeah. handle it. Um, how long are they on site like for? Two hours. Two hours. But that's a six-hour shift. So. But you tell them, right? You tell the client ahead of time that you're going to only be there for two hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those things are important. And are you serving for two hours? or Are you there for two hours? We serve until we sell out. So, okay. Yeah, it's like fifty people. If we can do it in an hour, we're out. But wow. they're guaranteeing so. fifty. Is that how it goes? Yeah. So you're guaranteed. vending, but you're doing a minimum. Okay. Yeah. I get it. No, I get it. Yeah. That's that actually pretty sense. cool. Yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, especially for because we have stuff out. I live out in Hamul, and mm-hmm. um, you know, we'll end up catering all the food myself, and then have <laughs> all something, the time, all the time. Fuck, it's so yeah. funny. It's like I mean, it's the classic. You know, if you're in the village, the cobbler never takes care of his own shoes. It's like if Derek has a catering for his himself, like he doesn't do the prep list. It's like uh, all of a sudden, it, it, it's the same thing for me. Like Gene had to take care of our our. Thanksgiving smoked turkey and we're like right. we're just the worst. I don't follow my own process, my own right. procedures. <laughs> my wife's like, what do we have? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'll get it done though. I'll get stuff here. We'll have food. And I'm putting tables um, and chairs in Derek's car the day of the event. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean it would be just a really cool thing to have at like 
you know, the events that we have with all the kids and stuff, just an ice cream, something kind of different. Thought it would have been, I mean, stuff like that, because, you know, that's where you talk about those relationships and those partnerships where you start working with other catering companies that are at a wedding. You know, when we cater weddings, we don't do dessert. I mean, we do peach cobbler, but having ice cream as an option, I mean, I guarantee you, Adam Harris, they would have done that, you know, for sure. Well, just think about I mean, it's bomb for us. So cool for the next. I mean, we can even put it as an add on for us. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. just cross market and say, hey, we'll do this and we can get Snoyce to come out and do uh, some shaved ice and boba and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I would do it. Yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. That'd for be, sure. Be rat. Makes it easy for the people planning their weddings. Like, right. It's, one, it's all connected. You could just pick from the businesses. So talk about the press that you guys got and why it was important to get it on your website and put the links up there. Cause some people, you know, don't understand that backend SEO side. Um, it was important to us because, you know, it's hard to get featured anywhere. <laughs> very um, hard. Very hard. And it's getting so. easier though. If you do, <laughs> if you do, if you hack it the right way, you, it's kind of a hack though. You got to understand and you got to do things right. I mean, if you do things right and you're telling the right story, I mean, not everybody's trying to make their community better. And it's not about Snoyce. It's about Paradise Hills. And that's really why you guys have gotten, you know, extra coverage on top of having sexy product and things that taste amazing that people really want. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, I think we haven't even reached our potential with our food. Like we've been getting a lot more press for Maiden Paradise Hills or um, these events, but not exactly our food. So until recently. And so I think that it's, it's important for us to share it because we don't get it that often. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of our way of like patting ourselves on the back because there's no other way where we can kind of say, Hey, sure. Well, yeah, but it legitimizes you too. You know, and it's like for us, it's not about us, but like we went on Fox Five. Like if somebody wants to get involved with Spring Valley Barbecue Festival, if we don't have a link of what we went on, you know, Channel Eight to go do, like that's the easiest way to tell the story, you know, because mm-hmm. we're there telling Heather Myers exactly why, you know, we're putting we're bringing amateur barbecue teams out and why we're bringing other barbecue restaurants out and organizations and training the people that we're raising money for. It, it's all right there in a pro, you know professionally produced video, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that it's the best way. Press is the best way to tell that extended story. Like, there's so much to tell. I mean, so much history behind a logo or how much you um, wanted, the values that you wanted to express. And so we use that as an outlet because uh, Instagram, they'll swipe over it. They're just mm-hmm. looking at the pictures right. and stuff. So um, that's why we embrace the press. Sure. Well, it's, it's embracing the press, but you guys, you know, it's the thing that we talk about. Like, you guys are your own press. Like, you know, you've, you've turned into a media company, which is what we talk about by, for us podcast. I mean, you, we all have to be our own media company and we have to embrace the fact that we need to know how to use video. We need to use how, how to take photos with our iPhone. We need to know how to publish. We need to know how to create content because you don't know where those eyeballs are going to come from and you don't know who's going to come into your door anytime. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, anybody. And at any point, you know, we wouldn't have the relationships that we did if it wasn't for embracing the opportunities that are out there and letting people know who Cali Comfort is, whether they even come into the shop ever or not. Right. What are those little balls in the boba to you? <laughs> I've always wondered. So I'll have them. And they have you had that before? I haven't. Dude, try oh, it. Whoa. It's like a little. Um, Which one? This Either is one. a Thai tea and this is an Okinawa. So. Okinawa? For you listeners, we my, have... My brother was born in Okinawa. <laughs> we have uh, yeah. these boba teas here right now. Sean's opening up, and there's a little... Bo- is this... Are they everywhere? Yeah, they're yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, everywhere they're throughout the United oh. States, usually people are, are having them. You have I had them at a, at a pho place. Yeah, not... Ooh, open it. There you go. There you go. Um, but there's like little balls of... Uh, I don't know. What you, it's a tapioca balls. Tapioca so balls. It's just starch. There's no nutritional value to it. Right. It's just kind of um, it's an Asian craze where they wanted to change it up in their teas and milk teas and it's just good. Have a chew. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Seriously, just it's different, really right? Good. No, it's really good. Did you Did you get into those I balls? Think, yeah, I chew them, bro. I already did. Nice. They're bomb. <laughs> it's just different. I'm I'm a fan. I was I was I didn't know what to expect from like the first time of it was going to be like filled with anything oh if it's just God, gonna pop good. and it was just kind of something cool right it's something really different. good yeah it's really good yeah 
I'm telling you. And then talk to me about the Halo Halo. So that's another classic Filipino dessert. Okay. Um, it started off with just beans and milk because that's what beans, uh, beans, really beans and milk and ice as their way of staying cool in the Philippines. And it's all they could afford. But, you know, they started throwing any and every ingredient in there. And holo holo means mix mix in Tagalog. And so that's their, I think every, um, it's like a culture. dessert, dessert goulash. Just throw yeah. everything, throw yeah. everything in there and mix it around. Exactly. I'm fucking into that. It's like a dessert <laughs> salad. Nice. Um, and so I, we try to pick ingredients that are colorful, but you can literally throw anything in there and it's a hollow hollow. Every, every culture has a frozen dessert, you know, uh, drink or like smoothie or something right. like a respato or a chimango. This is the Filipino version. Of Have it. you been out to the Philippines yourself? Twice. Yeah. Uh, as a kid, but I don't. Rem- I'm not in tune. I don't even speak Tagalog or anything. Right, your wife. I don't, speak, my Bul- wife- I don't speak Bulgarian. Don't feel bad. <laughs> but my once my son starts speaking with my wife, I'm I'm gonna have to catch up so I don't get I don't get rubbed down. Talking about dad. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about dad. And plotting yeah. and scheming. Right. Yeah. So my wife goes almost every or every other year. Her family makes it a point because most of their families there. It's the opposite for me, where my family all immigrated here. So. Um, and they didn't want to confuse us. They didn't want us learning Tagalog. So they really, yeah, that's always like, interesting. Isn't that weird? Cause that's what happened with my mom. So my family, I'm Hispanic and on my Hispanic side, my grandma didn't want my mom and my uh, uncles to learn Spanish because she didn't want them to either get made fun of or anything like that. So she didn't teach them how to, how to speak the language. And then it's like, it's the best thing that would ever happen to them. And then right. my grandma would speak to us in Spanish a lot. And it's like, man, it'd be really cool if my mom would have. I think, I think culturally and generation, generationally, things are changing. Yeah. Because I think, you know, our generation, we're embracing our roots and trying to find out more about our blood and where we're from and, you know, the story behind it. It's, you know, we, we want to embrace it. I mean, that's what makes us unique, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all about finding our de- identity. Sure. And so that's kind of why, like, Maiden Paradise Hills came about was I was proud of where I grew up with or in and sure so I, I didn't identify with the philippines it was paradise hills right. well you had i mean it's not only that but like you did something that nobody else was doing because there was a perception of paradise hills right yeah and we just wanted to change it we because just, you knew there was good people there right yeah. and you wanted to make it cool like yeah. it is fucking cool like my friends are cool like the people i grew up with are cool like yeah there's there's idiots in every village guess what that's not that's not like breaking news right you know well, i mean just think about I mean, for me, if I tell someone I grew up in Spring Valley, they're like, oh. Yeah. I'm like, it's really not that bad. I know. You know, when I talk to people, they're like, uh, you, like we're going to go down that street? Yes. it's. Yes. Fu- I walk down that street every fucking day of my life. It's fine. Like, like oh, we heard bad things. I'm like, sure. Shit happens every once in a while, but it's not like the worst place in the world. Yeah. <clears throat> but what we need to do is really highlight the positive people that are doing the right things in these communities. And put them in the forefront. You know, it's so easy to look at the negative shit. Well, anyone can do that. Let's look at the positive stuff and the people that are doing the positive things and lift them up. Sure. Not not just highlight the, the bad guys, you know? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, every time I do orientation with staff and we talk about, you know, when you're coming and you're parking, you know, be safe when you go to your car. But if I if our restaurant if our restaurant was in La Jolla, I would tell them the same thing. Like anything bad can happen anywhere in the world and places get a perception because something might, something bad might have happened, but be respectful, know what's going on and celebrate the good things that are going on because there's some amazing stuff, but it takes getting outside of your comfort zone. It takes you as a business owner going to the guy next door that hasn't said anything to the other family for years and you making that connection and saying, Hey, this is what we're trying to do, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and he himself or she they have to believe it too you know like it, it doesn't just work just because you want it to work because trust me there's plenty of people that told me to go fuck off yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean how many times do you, you hear about you know people that have you know bad relationships with their neighbor and it's just been going on and you know no one's taking the initiative to go talk to them there's a fucking big pothole in here and we need to fix it no one wants to fix it and then the next generation comes up and they're like look Let's put that shit behind us. Who cares? I'll fix it. And you go and fix it. And then you open that relationship up and you start talking to them. Then all of a sudden they're like, 
oh, there's one here too. I'll, I'll, I'll help you fix it. Then you start getting a little bit of traction. Then everyone wants to start helping. And they, they realize it's not just you looking out for just what you get. It's look, we, we all want this to do better. We all want Paradise Hills to, to get a better name. Um, Spring Valley to have a, a great name. <clears throat> but it takes that person to take that step, that leap of faith. That's yeah, it's not it, always easy. It's really fucking exciting for us because, you know, what we always said was since the Santa Sofia parade and Casa de Oro. That, that was my uh, shit. I you know, since then, thing. there hasn't been anything until the Spring Valley Barbecue Festival. And now with what you guys are doing in Paradise Hills, this is something that we can all celebrate together. Yeah. You can bet your ass you're going to have to deal with us helping out with whatever you need. Yeah, no, whatever you, you know, need you, anytime. You, you made the commitment to us, and you came out, and you stepped up, and you came out to our event so that, to help us raise money. And, you know, we learned because you did what you said you were going to do. And we know how hard it is owning a business and going out and doing those events, but that's where you grow the most. That's where you actually make those relationships that count. And my wife grew up in Spring Valley, so she was super proud to see. It was our first time to the Spring Valley barbecue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the first two years we were here, we were just getting our feet wet. And, sure. You know, back five, into million, five million things on the checklist, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it was amazing, Sarah. She, she was like, oh, my gosh. Like, Isn't it cool? It's mm -hmm. just, you know, an eclectic mix of people coming out and celebrating the different varieties of barbecue that we have in San Diego and amateurs that are trying to learn their craft and trying to, you know, put it in for the judges and you know tony was doing his thing on the stage and he's always doing his thing <laughs> shout out to tony absolutely he's, he's always we fly him out here every year because we just fucking we love what he does and uh he, he brings a presence to that stage that he gets it he gets the group he's he understands the people how, how to get them going i couldn't do it yeah you know some people were born for what they do best and yeah some uh, there must have been a, a microphone in his crib because yeah he put the guy on the stage and he just uh you know he was meant to do that yeah for sure um but i want to give a sh social shout out to our man uh christopher wood he um emailed sean and i um later last or last week and uh was just take talking about how he's really enjoying the podcast he's out in uh northern virginia and he's uh looking at taking the the entrepreneurial leap and jumping off that cliff um, with Primacy Meat Company, he's um, you know listening to what we've what we've been saying, and he's understanding. He's actually, you know, what I was talking about earlier with with you, but he's um, going down to Texas to talk to some pit masters to kind of do an internship, like not getting paid, just kind of learn from them. Um, so we want to give him a shout out if you guys can give him a follow. Primacy Meat Company, it's already up on social on. Um, Instagram, right? Sean? I love it. Yeah. We're so proud of uh, Christopher and for anybody that reaches out and tells us, you know, what their dreams are, what their hopes are. We, we know firsthand how hard it is to open up a business, to jump off that cliff. But I mean, the biggest thing is you think that you're alone and you're not, right. um, you know, there's like-minded people that are fucking badass people and, you know, people like Coops. I know Coops just got his, uh, his chicken shack open back up. Yes. Love yeah. that guy. Yeah. You know, Chris from Smoke Talk, all these people that are doing their thing and, you know, for us to be able to celebrate that and, you know, if they get inspiration from, you know, Scott Heath, the president of Fox 5 talking about digital marketing or Sam, the cooking guy, um, that's really cool for us because, you know, re really, we're, we're learning so much just yeah. by um, talking to people that are doing cool stuff and we want to see the journey and it doesn't matter if it's in paradise hills or if it's in uh northern virginia i mean that that that's really really cool so yeah i'm just uh excited to see what 2018 brings um i can't wait to partner up with noise whatever we can do if there's a catering i'll, I'll hit you up if there's uh, we can add you on anytime um if you have any events you're going to throw i know sean and i are more than happy to to help out um we don't do just barbecue. We can do whatever you want. So make sure you reach out. Use us. Um, yeah, if you, always... if you need us to shut down the street or to sweep the parking lot, yeah. we're, we're not shy. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Probably but recruit some people, too. Thank you so much for taking the time out. To yeah, we talk appreciate to us, it. Man. Follow these guys on social, uh, Snoice SD. Uh, interact with them. Go down, check out the shop, and uh, 
be sure to write us a review on pod, on uh, iTunes because that means a lot to us. It helps out the show and uh, subscribe. And send us some emails. Send them, if you guys need any stickers, whatever you want, let us know. We'll oh yeah, we got we free sticker. You got oh you got some hot shit, man. Yeah, oh, don't bullshit. Sticker. Don't be don't be shy about that. I'm Fuck those shy. stickers have been flying uh, flying off the shelves, dude. Corey's yeah. hiding them on social on Insta stories. Corey's yeah. been hiding them in the beer. Yeah, they've been inside the Yetis. Big hit. <laughs> Did some shirts. They're um, really good, man. I like them. I dig them. Just an old vintage uh, neon that I had up on the store. Figured, yeah, I love on, it. Put it on some stickers and I some fucking shirts. love it. Yeah, yeah. Hit us up. We'll get you some free stickers. Um, we appreciate you guys tuning in. The podcast it means a lot. Look forward to a, a big 2018. Boom. <laughs>